I always, I always wonder what would happen if I said leave meeting, but I don't. Anyway, I'm Bonnie Halper. I write the weekly Startup One Stop newsletter, have done since 2009, and I've been covering the industries for a long time. And I write a somewhat, if some people say, opinionated editorial and also include many links that are helpful to entrepreneurs. And every two weeks, we host an investor breakfast. We used to do them in person at Kettle Space. Now we do them online. And we only have one investor and a small self-selecting group of entrepreneurs so that everybody gets to participate. And we thank Kettle Space, who has Bar Bar in the background, Joseph, because that's where we used to host them. You want to talk about Kettle Space and how you're handling uh, co restaurant co-working at present? Sure. Thanks, Bonnie. Welcome, everyone. Joseph Katz, a, a head of marketing for Kettle Space. Um, we are a workplace technology company. We're based in New York. Uh, over the last few months, we built software that allows companies to bring their employer employees back to the office using the hybrid work models. And uh, we still run our co-working locations. We have four open in New York City right now. And uh, as, the, as the world continues to reopen, we will continue to evolve that part of our business. Uh, we're primarily focused on helping companies return back to their spaces. So welcome, good to be here and uh, enjoy. And our guest today is Marat. Marat, how many times have you done this? Now? Marat has been, is the founder of ER Accelerator, one of the top accelerators in the country, if not the world actually. And he's, he and I go way back. So Marat, uh, I don't even know, I've lost count at this point. Uh, many times, <clears throat> thanks so much Bonnie. But like also we, we've done events together in person yes. so many times find a co-founder or like you know going back now like 14 13 years so bonnie and i we've done so much and bonnie is one of the people that built the current new york startup ecosystem which is booming if anyone like if you haven't seen the numbers new york is now in terms of dollar amounts new york city startups raised uh, 50 percent of the amount of silicon valley startups i saw that 14 years ago it was around 10 percent of silicon valley and new york is, is growing super fast and silicon valley is now not growing actually this became like a new york promotion uh event right now <laughs> I, I love new york and uh i want to say this new york is now the num number two startup center in the world the most active uh, and um, obviously some later stage uh, growth equity, people coming into the startup space like Tiger Global and, you know, Insight Partners and others help this. But uh, we've always known New York, like I've known that New York is a great place for startups. Now the numbers are showing it. So I'm super excited. And Bonnie is one of the people that made it happen. Very active since the beginning. So Murak, do you want to talk about the program and or do you want to meet the people in the room first? I would love to meet uh, people here to see how we can uh, maybe give them the relevant information. But I can maybe briefly say one thing. We are a VC fund. Uh, we do pre-seed, seed A and B investments. On the pre-seed sides, we uh, invest $100,000. We take 8% common equity. And then uh, those pre-seed invested companies, which is around 30 companies a year, they go through a four month accelerated program. Those programs are twice a year, uh, starting in January and June. And we've been doing this for 12 years, 11 years now. Uh, we are going to run our 22nd class. So my partner, John and I, we've been, we've run in person, hands on 21 classes together. Uh, so it's not like we hired people and we left, we are still there. And we are very excited. We have 500 mentors, including Bonnie. And those mentors help the companies throughout the four months with everything from product marketing, sales, fundraising, positioning, partnerships. And then we actually do a demo day, used to be in person, with around six to 700 investors. Um, it used like before the pandemic, obviously. And when these companies raise more money and they raise their seed round, A round, uh, we have a fund that goes on us follow on investing uh, into some of the companies. So in effect, we are life cycle investors. We don't just give you a small check and take equity and leave. Uh, we do that, then we engage. We help you with everything. We do not take board seats. 
and we uh, also do like invest in your seed round and A round and B round. And this year we've been very lucky. We had two uh, billion dollar plus exits. Uh, one of our companies went public on Nasdaq. It's called Catapult. Buy now, pay later. We were the first investor in the company, and then we invest in their seed round, A round, and B round. And we have another exit this year. Bunny knows them really well. Eric Berry with Triple Lift. Yep. They were acquired for $1.4 billion in cash by a private equity firm, with Equity Partners. And again, we were the first investor, and Triple Lift only raised a very small like some very small amount of money around 14 million dollars and they exited for 1.4 billion dollars so we are very lucky investors so we made 1242x on our initial investment as a return usually typically vcs shoot for 3x by the way i just want to mention so 3x we did 1242x so it's good to get lucky sometimes i knew you had that nice exit but, and you only invest in companies that go through the accelerator, right? Correct. We only invest through the accelerator. And um, obviously, you know, our whole network, we find the teams and the markets that we can help with. And we are journalists. We really do like invest in most technology companies. Recently, our last class, uh, half of our class was digital health. And obviously we do a lot of fintech, AI, and many different areas. We also do consumer products. We have successful companies in those spaces. But uh, I'm also an entrepreneur. My background is computer science. I still do some programming, so I'm dangerous as a programmer still. But uh, yeah, I would love to uh, meet people here and see if we can be helpful to them. So David, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, David. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I misheard you. Um, yes, I'm Dave Robson in Baltimore. Um, I'm one of two people starting an ed tech uh, company. Uh, we are approaching um, our MVP. It's been in coding for really a few months now. Um, the function of the tool is to improve mathematics learning in K-12. And it achieves that two ways. Um, first, it reduces the pretty substantial workload of the mathematics teacher. And secondly, at the end of the school year, the students know more math, remember more math, and therefore do well, uh, do better on their end of year state exam. So that's, uh, that's a good place to pause. Thanks, David. That sounds very interesting. And I would love to come back and ask you questions maybe later. Right. Thank you. Eric Chen. Mark, do you know Eric? Yes, of course. Yes, of course you do. Hi, Eric. How are you? Hey, how are you? Great. Uh, let me... Hey, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I... <clears throat> Thank you, and I love to join Bonnie, you know, like what you say, he, she know everybody. Um, I, myself, is a member of a New Angel and also a sponsor for New Angel. Um, I have a business doing product innovation. You know, mostly is a, like, hardware, IoT, wearable, and I used to design many big, you know, brand name like LG Panasonic, Herman Miller is all my client. So right now I have a small team, but I'm doing a lot more advising for many technology startup, you know, from XLZ and you and NYU and New Lab and, and Urban X. So I love to work with you, you know, Marat, you know, so if you have any people that really need help, you know, I, I'm happy to be you know, on, on the advisory or consultant, you know, to mentor, you know, the company. I okay, myself absolutely. also, I, yeah, I also uh, on Chopolo, you know, I did product invention and try to test the market, you know, always learn new things. So that's what I like to meet all these people. 
you know, and so love to hear more about everybody's doing in the pandemic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Great to have you here. Thank yes. you. Eric, are you still in New York? Oh, yeah. I, I have a, actually have a space uh, in packing. Um, I'm moving it to a shared space now. Actually, it's a custom. It's part of the candle. Uh, uh, custom house. Yeah. Custom yeah. house. Yeah, yeah. Custom house, yeah. So we have some space there. Because we used to be renting the, the space downstairs. So now we consolidate to make it up. So I may meet you there. You know, because it's very convenient. It's a very nice space. Thank you. You, you always have a nice space. And then also I have a space in a new lab too. So one oh. of the startup, they want to give me a, a space that I can make prototype and work with them. I have a multiple advising role in some of the company there. And very interesting, very exciting. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense and good for you. Christina, I have, Christina. Oh, you're muted right now. Thank yes, you. I just I just unmuted myself. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you for the host that is uh, that have allowed for us to be here to have this conversation today. I'm currently a future investor. I'm a co-owner of Surfy Sisters Auto Sales. I'm currently in the works of Jersey's Exotic Motorsport. <laughs> I want to partner up with Ford, McLaren, um, Lamborghini and allow them to showcase their vehicles in my exotic showcase room. So that's all in the works. I'm trying to put that together and I'm excited to network and learn as much as I can today from everyone here who's been in the game. So um, I'm just really happy to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So what do you want to ask Yes, yeah, see that. And yeah, I knew that uh, Lil was an investor. So you're both investors on Leaf Hunter. You should talk. You and, you and uh, Lil. Anyway, sorry, didn't mean to. I'm a connector. I, I connect people. <laughs> Uh, Trip, introduce yourself. I'm Trip Braden. I work with Bonnie and present, uh, presenting on Wednesday with our clubhouse for startups. If you haven't been there, it's nine o'clock Eastern time every Wednesday. Uh, what I do for a profession, I help companies find their right partners and associates. So I'm a former president of Microsoft Partners for the Midwest. Uh, I also have been with IBM a number of years since 1994. And I have a lot of connections in the technology market space, having been with a number of early stage companies and have bought 70 strategic acquisitions in my career. So I, I kind of go full life cycle. Once you're second stage, which I would say have revenue and are looking to accelerate, that's where I really can help you a lot because I can take my Rolodex like Bonnie's and, and accelerate it into uh, making revenue happen more quickly. And today in particular, to get better resources. So you look for partners in service industries that can partner with you so you don't have to buy all the labor you need and you can still accelerate your growth. Thank you, Bonnie. Oh, thank you. Uh, Jimmy, you're muted right now, but do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, sorry. Let me um, work on my camera as well. So, oh, there you are. Hi, hi I'm Jimmy Antia. Um, I'm uh, currently uh, in conversation with one of my friends, an academic who predicts uh, flu outbreaks using Twitter data on ways to commercialize um, that type of... Uh, data analytics and prediction ability, and still in the process of finding the right problem or problem sets to work on the right niche. Um, so working with a lot of people on, on narrowing that down and just interested in learning more about the space and if anybody has any um, ideas or people to talk to about kind of who to, uh, who to talk to about narrowing down the problem set uh, would be much appreciated. Uh, thank you for your time. Well, we have a lot of experts in the room, that's for sure. <gasps> And Tommy Michelle. Hey, Give Tommy. Hi, Tommy. Everyone knows Tommy as well. Bonnie and Tommy, everyone knows that. <laughs> Hi, guys. Good morning. <laughs> um, thanks for having me, Bonnie. Nice to see you, Marat. Um, I uh, I have a like a varied background. I've been in. Um, uh, a startup and entrepreneurial women's community. Um, I've been a little bit in finance, a little bit in engineering, um, and I just uh, finished a master's in data science. Um, I'm, I, I love uh, natural language processing and deep learning. I'm doing a few things in, in, 
in that area and I'm starting a, a dating app which has a sort of like a human led and um, sort of like AI first um, uh, but that I'm very excited about um, and uh, and yeah great to see everyone thank you well, any, any questions from Iraq I guess I could start it out Murat, when you're you're out there today you're looking at a lot of opportunities you're evaluating people help people understand if you wouldn't mind some of the things you're looking for because I think it's so mystical to people who are startups what are people looking for and how do they get that target better so if you wouldn't mind sharing that that'd be great okay. uh, do you mean like sector wise or yeah I, I guess we can start the sector and then start looking because I think what a lot of people don't realize what you have to you go through uh, you see hundreds of companies every week how do, what stands out to you and how do you make that happen if you want to share a little bit of magic behind the scenes so they can be better prepared for it it'd be great yes oh, because i noticed that you i noticed that you said that uh, half your cohorts last last go were health it so yeah i was curious about that too thank you chip Absolutely. so we are very lucky because uh like like bunny i've been uh in the new york community for 14 years organizing events every month we have 500 mentors now we have around we have 245 investments with around 700 founders. So we get many applications from New York, from the US, from around the world. So we are able to see what's really going on all the time. And obviously, as I just said, healthcare, uh, digital health is uh, really, really coming very strong because the current system is really not satisfactory. And I think many things will change in the current system. So we have some companies that are uh, doing uh, little things around healthcare and they are very successful. They are growing fast, they're raising lots of money. So I think if you are solving a problem in healthcare and if you can tap into the payers or the consumers somehow uh, for revenue, you can build a very large business. But obviously like in healthcare, there are three different components. There's payer, provider, and the patient. Uh, so as a startup, obviously we highly recommend like you set your business model in the right way. Make sure your target payer will actually is not going to take like two years to sign up. But mainly we are also seeing people having their own personal problems and they go and solve these personal problems. Like they had a problem. We have amazing companies in the space. Uh, I'm very proud of them. Uh, they experienced a major issue and then they started a company to solve it. In our last class, we have a company called Andiamo. And uh, kids with cerebral palsy, you know, they have difficulty obviously moving and uh, the doctors prescribe casts for their legs. But these casts are generic casts and they hurt the children. So the founding team actually had a child with cerebral palsy and they experienced this, and um, it's a very powerful story, actually. And eventually, they start this company to solve it. They 3D print casts. They put sensors in the cast. So if the cast is not comfortable, the doctors get a digital twin of the patient's uh, you know, situation. So doctors can, in real time, change the cast. And we have many videos of kids using Andiamo and in a very happy way. They're like very happy walking around, running around. So that makes me very like happy uh, as a tech person that, you know, we are actually solving really real problems and, you know, changing uh, lives. It makes me very happy. So we are also obviously seeing lots of fintech companies. Um, we are, I am also personally very interested in decentralized finance blockchain. Uh, we have one crypto company uh, in the payments space. And uh, we also have a company that's touching now collectibles and NFTs very like not very closely. Uh, we are also looking into like quantum computing, but we are looking into not like a quantum computing hardware, which is the main topic right now, but we are looking to more the software stack, the platforms, um, we are also quite very strongly, we are, I'm very interested in space technologies, microsatellites, imaging, 
uh, imaging through clouds to see if an area has some problems for farmers. So we have a company called weather.ai. Uh, they can predict extreme weather damage in real time, which is very useful for utility companies and you know local governments. Uh, we also are seeing more uh, like consumer products, direct to consumer companies, because the you know if you can figure out the customer acquisition costs, these can grow very quickly. Um, we are also seeing, obviously, insure tech companies, companies in insurance, improving underwriting, which is really needs uh, un, like improvement quite a lot. Underwriting is still done in a very old fashioned way. And we are looking into companies that are using uh, machine learning, deep learning, large data sets to improve insurance underwriting in many different areas, from car insurance, for uh, diverse populations to uh, like home insurance, property insurance that you can just buy on a mobile app. And whenever there's a damage, you just take a photo of your house, of the roof and the, you know, all the filings are, is done automatically. So in a way, like we see so many different things. We get around 1,500 applications every six months and we interview around 10% of these, and then we invest in 1%, around 14 to 15 companies every six months. So I'm personally very interested in companies where the founder is a domain expert, it's a large market, and this domain expert founder says, I have a problem, I'm experiencing a problem, or I'm seeing a problem, and they go and build a company and solve that problem. Uh, our network is very strong, as I mentioned, like Bunny is one of our mentors, and we go in and help the company holistically, not just with, you know, sales or fundraising, but with everything from products to positioning, strategic partnerships to go to markets, which segment is the right segment. Many companies come into ERA and they change their business model, pricing, products, almost everything during the program with the feedback. And obviously the founders decide on everything, like nobody can tell them what to do, but the founders really uh, like a sponge. They get all the feedback from all the mentors, all the investors, all the people in the network, and then they make changes. Uh, one company that Bani knows well, Uni Samashima with Chikori. Uh, Uni spoke at the events last night for one of our global programs. And he talked about how like they started with this one idea about turning a recipe into a shopping cart because recipes say like a pinch of salt or some chicken broth and they take that and turn it into like a shopping cart you can just click and buy and the initial idea was to actually charge a commission on each transaction but then during the program they realized grocery uh, e-commerce the, the margins are nothing really it's like 0 0.001 so we couldn't take a commission of nothing so we changed the company to become more like an advertising company for food companies, and that's a $160 billion market. So now they're doing really, really well. Uh, seven years into the company, uh, they haven't raised much money, but they're profitable, they, are, they have huge revenue. And Uni last time mentioned that the program and the mentors and the exposure and the focus in four months, like we push our funders pretty hard in terms of KPIs. They set up some goals and they follow them. So it's really, um, the program is to help uh, very strong founding teams to achieve things much quicker. And that's only done by lots of learning and uh, trial and error. But uh, through coming back to your question, I answered like a politician. I didn't really answer the question, but you know, it's so many new things are coming up all the time. And we love seeing new ideas that we were not expecting. And since we are journalists, uh, we are always very open-minded to invest in new areas. If we have enough experts that can help us think about new areas. It's very exciting times. Murat, thank you. Um, what's interesting also, just for people in the room, if you think about what Murat's saying, it's adopting and adapting different ideas together and not thinking of yourself as being this inventor in a room that's creating something that's brand new. You know, a lot of people think that's what we're talking about when we're talking about startups. Successful startups use 
a variety of technologies and capabilities and combine them in a new way. And that's very clear with a lot of the clients that you've had that have been companies that have been successful is they haven't just looked at something and said, I'm going to invent it because I, I can, I'm an inventor. It's I'm looking for a, a problem and targeting a specific thing and then applying a number of technologies to make it even more extensively capable quickly. It's, it sounds like you have a, a speed focus in your, your accelerator as well. Correct? I mean, we, we've been doing this now for 11 years. Uh, we have a lot of pattern recognition. We can spot problems very quickly. Like pricing is always a problem or the go-to-market segment is always a huge problem. And some startups try to do many, many things at the same time. And it's like very obviously simple advice that you should do one thing because you're a startup, you're like one or two or three people. So when we merge the experience from our mentor network with those companies, really good things happen. And as Trip said, it's a really bad idea to go into a room alone and build a startup. Like it's a really bad idea. You should be out there talking to everybody and getting feedback all the time. And I think that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks of most startups is their go-to-market strategy. They forget that they don't, they don't have one. And I think right. they just real. try everything. Yeah. And they email everyone they know and they like stumble around for a long time before they realize they must focus on one thing. So one of our companies uh, now, it's a very large company, almost like the valuation is reaching a billion dollars almost. And they are a software for customer service. And initially they targeted everyone, car dealerships, uh, Chris, uh, you may maybe you may have heard about them, but car dealerships, uh, jewelry retailers, banks, everyone. And they were not doing well. The company was really like struggling. Then they decided to focus on only one market and say no to all the other segments. And they fired like 60% of their customers and they only focused on banking, financial services. And now, as I mentioned, they are reaching almost a billion dollar valuation just because they said, we are going to focus, we'll set our ideal customer profile, ICP. And at one point I tried to introduce them to IKEA, head of innovation at IKEA. And they said no to me. Imagine a startup, a small startup, saying no to a potential introduction to, to have IKEA as a customer. That's focus, that's really, you know, uh, discipline. I highly recommend, like, identify the right customer segment, just focus on them, know your ICP, ideal customer profile, and just go for it. What is another stumbling block for startups? Uh, lack of cash. <laughs> you, when you run out of cash, the company is shut down. So you must watch your burn rates and you must be very, very careful. Obviously, like I've run companies and, uh, you know, I made so many mistakes. Uh, so also like raising money is a huge challenge. Sometimes you don't have customers or revenue, but you know, you can raise money even with nothing. If you have the right background, you have the right idea, and you can present the vision to the right investors. Obviously, some investors are later stage VCs, uh, but, you know, Eric Chan here is part of New York Angels. And if you can convince these people that you have the right vision and you can execute, then you can raise money. But fundraising, also some people think it's like, oh, like, I need to know certain people to fundraise, not really. Uh, you know, New York Angels, you can apply them to them on their website. You can apply to us on our website. Um, it's really all about, you know, having access to the right information and network and experience. And like these all can be done. I'm, I'm originally from Turkey. I was born in Turkey. I came to move to US, San Francisco when I was after my master's degree in Turkey. So I went to school in Turkey as well. And, you know, I've really met my network after I was like 25. So when I moved here, so my point is really, it can be done. You just need to do the right things and, you know, work hard. And you started in Silicon Valley and moved to New York later. Why? Great question. So I moved to San Francisco in 1993. And after five years, I, I was sent to New York on a business trip for a conference. 
I was working for SGI, Silicon Graphics, and I landed in New York City and in less than like 24 hours, I decided that to move to New York because I love New York. I'm a big promoter of New York City and um, I love everything about New York, the culture, the diversity, you know, and the opportunities. So I think also, like Bonnie, you grew up in Manhattan, right? In New York City, I mean. Well, close enough. I was, I was born in New Jersey. I grew up in New York. Okay. But I think uh, the good thing is in New York City, uh, I have fresh numbers because I just talked to some, some gave a presentation about this, uh, about all the tech startup workers, 47% of them are foreign born. 47, almost half startup tech workers are foreign born which means like <clears throat> New York City is like an amazing place, cosmopolitan, very uh, diverse, and there's so much opportunity for everyone. So I love New York City on so many different levels. Yeah. But we are all in New York City, so I don't need to convince anyone here, I hope. <laughs> next, next question. Anybody have a question? Oh yeah, Gary's guide is, everybody should be on that. Gary has been doing that now for 15 years. Yeah. Oh, it has all the events. But not everybody here is, is uh, in New York, like me at present, although I used to love going to events. I was at at least five events every night. And that's New York, that everybody's having events all the time. Is it like that again, that everyone is having an event every night, Marat? Not now, these days? Yes. Uh, no, but like, you know, Whenever it comes up, we are like, I try to go as much as possible, obviously. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, he used to, yeah. So I know that some people think that, uh, you know, joining an accelerator, giving up all that equity, and it's only like a few months, and, but they don't understand the value of it. The, the mentors bring that the uh, most, it's amazing when you go, when I go to a demo day and I listen to, or I, I know where the companies were at the start and where they are just a few months later, where they have revenue and they have serious partners and they're well on their way. Absolutely. It's more like entering a network of people, a community of founders and investors and mentors. It's a lifetime thing. We actually realized, uh, my partner and I, we reinvested in ERA founders now, like meaning like, ERA has invested in a founder multiple times, around 12 times, 12 founders. We invest in their company, they went through ERA, then they started a new company and we invest in them again. Meaning uh, we are like, like, you know, life suck, like we invest in the companies and we invest in the founders again when they start their next company. Uh, so it's a community of people that really help each other all the time. It's not just like a single wire transfer from someone. It's like a big community. One of my favorite stories is remember, I, mean, I hope this is not a sore subject right before demo day, get made. Remember that one? You had a major pivot. Exactly. Uh, this company was doing something else. Site yes. uh, Simon, and then they pivoted into like a, a cleaning service for apartments. And it's a great story because these founders, uh, they ended up getting acquired by a company which got acquired by Google. They were at Google for two years. They left, they started a new company and we really wanted to invest in them. So they let us invest in their new company. And now this company is 30 Madison, is one of our unicorns. They recently raised $140 million at the billion dollar valuation. But we invested in them <clears throat> when they were 22. And now, like, uh, the point is, like, when you find the right founders, uh, you know, you should keep investing in them. It's meaning, like, we literally invest in people, obviously. But mind you, they, they decided to completely change businesses, like, five days before demo day. <laughs> exactly. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Please, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I just have a question. It's, it's on a different, slightly different topic, but related. No, no, go on, Tommy. Um, so I'm curious, uh, about the, um, it's, it's going to sound a little vague, but, uh, I'm curious about trying to build a team before you get funding or before you join an accelerator. 
um, versus doing it with the guidance of, say, ERA, um, and, and also, um, you know, being more informed about your model um, through that guidance. Um, so my specific, um, my specific situation would be like, how, how large should I have a team um, if, mm -hmm. if it is possible to, to get a lot of help um, prior to reaching out uh, in that way to accelerators? Tommy, absolutely. Uh, we really pay a lot of attention uh, to the relationship between the co-founders. So we always ask the co-founders in the interviews, like, when did you meet? How did you meet? How long have you known each other? Uh, have you done anything before together? And sometimes, you know, rarely we do invest in solo founders, but then we go in and help them find the right co-founders. Like out of 245 investments, I can maybe say three or four, by the way. It's like really not too many, maybe 2%. But tell me, as you know, like it's super important to have a co-founder because, you know, with a startup, there's no divorce. Like when you start a company with someone and if they leave, the company will probably die. And if you're like equal uh, shareholders. So it's super, super important to do anything and everything use all the advice, um, use like, do tryouts, tr do a trial period, spend a lot of time with the co-founder, like go to lunch, see if you want to spend the next 10 years of your life with this person. So it's a super important decision. So everything works. If you have someone that you've known for a while and you want to start a company with them and just start with them at the moment, you haven't decided on someone, but you can apply to ERA and we can try to be helpful with the decision. But every day I, we go through this when our companies are hiring new people or finding new co-founders or looking for like, uh, you know, important team members. It's a super, super important decision and anything and everything works. Like asking your common connections to this person about them literally asking for references from the person, like for people that they have worked for before, uh, their bosses or their colleagues. Yeah, there's like not one answer and it has to be organic, obviously. Like you cannot just meet someone today and start a company tomorrow. It will be like a huge risk and most investors would be very wary of investing in a team like that. Like we had an interview, it's a funny story one time and it was Zoom two years ago, and there were three co-founders. And at some point, we realized something. The three people have never met in person in real life. They just met online on LinkedIn, I think, and they've been doing Zoom calls with each other. They've never met in person in real life. And they were living in like very different locations. So that's definitely like not a great start. I, I feel like I'm, for this particular startup, I've cleared a lot off my plate, which normally um, sort of can make the experience a little bit more um, charged in terms of, um, I, I think that it, it, for me, like having the appropriate lifestyle and relationships with your team is, is super important. Um, and sometimes that gets overlooked because people are so worried about getting it right. Um, so actually, like everybody on my team are my friends, um, and right. just, yeah, and and people that I spent a lot of time with before I invited them to my startup. Um, so right. I just I just had uh, found a head of ML, which is great because I I want to uh, focus away from the product after you know uh, getting mm -hmm. my initial uh, download. Um, um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I'm really excited about that. And he's, he's just basically renowned for his work with his mentees and his interns and his teams. They love him. So, um, you know, he's very strong in that area. Right. Um, and, but, you know, like a lot of my friends being my friends, um, they, they would love to come on board if there were funding, but they have full-time jobs. So their commitment is small. So my team is a little bit large or it could be a little bit large if I formalize them as my team. Um, so it's, it's sort of, it's a, just a strange pos position I feel to be in to have a bunch of like people contributing small, super small roles. 
Um, right, but Tommy, like we've seen that many, many times for uh, most people are not founders. I mean, they would work for a startup, but they are not co-founders. It's completely fine as you reduce risk for them, as you raise money or as you get customers or revenue, they will join you. It's fine, but you have to structure it the right way so that if they never leave their full-time job, you should not be vulnerable. There is a startup should not fail if they decide they, they are going to keep their job at like a bank. Mm, exactly. But it's very common situation. Like some people are like, oh, I'll keep my job until you raise this much money. But then the cap table has to reflect that. You cannot give them like a lot of equity because then if they don't join, then you have this huge like hole in your cap table. Someone that is not active that is holding like twenty percent of the company that will kill the company. Yeah, so it's a lot of like discussion. But I think just having this focus on the experience is would really is just helping with the, the equity discussions. It's not a big deal, but yeah, it it requires more complex. Uh, you know, planning on my part. For sure. And also like co-founder agreements and vesting of equity with the cliff vesting. Yeah. These are all really like must do's, even if you are super close friends. Mm. Like we did invest in companies that were like a company with three very close friends. They had known each other since they were like eight years old mm. and they were like late twenties. And they actually had a major, major disagreement. And three of them literally left the company and they started their own companies, three different companies. Yeah. But they were like, we're out of here. And I was very uh, disappointed because they were like lifetime friends and they had a major, major fight. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Um, well, thank well, like you. your mileage may vary, but obviously, you know, you should be very careful and talk to as many people as possible. Introduce this, these people to as many people as possible in your network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not like a momentary decision. It should be like a long process. Mm. Interesting. Great. Next question. You know, I did notice that when we were doing introductions and uh, David was talking about his education startup, you had many questions. I, I'm assuming that that's a sector that you're looking at very closely, Marat. Definitely. So actually, I found David on LinkedIn and I found spiralmath.net. Correct. I, that's it. <clears throat> great. Uh, very interesting. David, I was going to ask you, do you, like, who is your customer? Is it the school system, teachers, students, families, parents? Uh, we're anticipating two tiers. That would be a teacher can sign up or a school slash district can sign up. Uh, the, right. Initially, the teacher tier will be artificially low cost uh, mm -hmm. because the teacher word of mouth is uh, the way they uh, do uptake on new ideas. David, as you're just talking, uh, we should connect offline. I spent a good chunk of my career in ed tech. Okay. And uh, I can make a couple of introductions for you. Great. Thank you. Not funding, uh, not funding introductions, just to be clear, I'll, more like <laughs> partnership, uh, growth, that kind of stuff. Sure. sure. No, that, uh, I understand totally. I'll uh, throw my contact in the chat and uh, maybe you could do the same and then we'll uh, continue. Great. Thank and you. David, uh, so the teacher, if they use this and the students take those courses or tests they get data insights um yes and look, and, uh, let oh. me let me just go through a few sentences of how it works um and the background here is that over the past 15 years the academic world this, this is the university researchers have uh, made substantial advances in uh, what has come to be known as learning science. Um, mm -hmm. And um, there's very little use made of that knowledge in K-12. Uh, we're using it very heavily. Um, and learning science can be a little misleading. Uh, we have found that it's really, we think of it as anti-forgetting science. And a typical uh, elementary math student can learn the math in September, October. We're focusing on third grade right now. So they're 
doing addition and two column addition and three column addition. And, and then they move on to multiplication and they move on to another topic. Late in the year, they've forgotten three column mm -hmm. addition. Mm -hmm. And the rate of forgetting is probably about half the rate of learning, uh, but it varies with time. And there's quite a bit of research on the time curves of that phenomenon. So my partner, uh, Joe, uh, in, in a sentence, uh, had, had developed a system. Uh, he, he quit his job as supervisor of mathematics for the state of Delaware because, oh, wow. because he had invented a system that would stop forgetting. And he couldn't stand doing administrative stuff. And so he developed the system, uh, proved that it worked, uh, sold it in 30 some school districts. Um, so uh, basically if you, uh, our kind of motto here is to the teacher, we would say, you teach them math, we stop them from forgetting. And uh, if students are going to move forward, say next year in grade four, they have to have good competency still uh, of grade three, even though the summer gap is in between. Mm. So retention is really, really critical more than other subjects. If they forget a little bit of social studies and they, they knew there were 13 founding colonies in the US and then the next year they think, oh, well, I can remember four of them. They've, mm. they've forgotten half, but it doesn't hurt their next year's social studies but it cripples their next year's mathematics. So we really shut down, uh, we're using the academic principles to shut down forgetting. And uh, kids who, our, our, our favorite pilot teacher uh, used this for two years, her uh, average increase in pass rate on the state exam was 280%. Wow, amazing. So David, if I may ask some questions. So sure. When you go out there, I see that you're in like now beta testing, but let's say you go out there to like to teachers and say, hey, we have this new tool. Yes. Do you have some like data, like a data that shows that in a like control group, like there are two groups, one of them did your test and the other did not. Can you show like actual difference that your uh, products what, contributes? What? Uh, al almost no, but there's one, one little shade on that. Um, and that is, uh, we had a four year relationship with our first uh, pilot teacher and we're, uh, uh, and uh, so we compared her first two years without us and the second two following two years uh, with us. That's where the 280 comes from. Um, yeah, and, very impressive. Uh, yeah. yeah, so now to be fair, uh, her pass rate, this is a Baltimore inner city charter school. Her students pass rate was, it changed from abysmally low to kind of low, but higher than the city average by a substantial amount. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, you're not hitting things out of the park always, but um, we feel that they can build up over the course of two or three years. There's a compounding competence and um, uh, so we, we look for the home runs over a longer period. Great, and last question. Can this apply to like any subjects or is it very math specific? Uh, it can apply to most subjects. We believe, well, for instance, I mentioned social studies. It can apply to social studies. Um, and most of the research has been done in other subjects uh, and they show good, uh, good results. Uh, there are some cautions, though, and that is uh, you have to have very good um, congruence between what the teacher is teaching and what the state exam is testing for. And in many subjects, it's very shoddy. Uh, now, I'll take it back. In many states, there's only two subjects that do this. That is the end of your state exam. Uh, they'll do it in math, they'll do it in uh, reading literacy uh, uh, English, uh, but they won't do it in other subjects. Um, so if, if you have really good congruence, then I think we can be effective in almost any subject, but there's the best congruence in math. And my partner is an expert math educator. So yeah, so we've got, we've got 12 years to get through that. 
<laughs> Got it. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. So we also see also see the potential of being like the Duolingo of math. We don't have to. You know, we're starting in the classroom, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about what works in the classroom. We were both classroom teachers, um, and most classroom tools are uh, really a misfit uh, developed by people who weren't there. Um, uh, but uh, so we're, right now, we're trying to maximize our fit with the classroom. Um, but later we could cut free of that for the uh, Duolingo model. <clears throat> oh, thank you. It's very interesting. I'm very interested in like your domain expertise and your co-founders domain expertise. Like you were classroom teachers. So you're not just like coming up with an idea about like you, your co-founder said like, I want to improve retention, information retention on maths and he yep. found out a way Yes. So this is great. So you're actually solving a problem that you experienced. Oh, ab ab absolutely. Um, um, and for a new teacher, first or second year teacher, it can make all the difference because uh, yep. it gives the teacher explicit guidance on what shall we do first today. Um, uh, <laughs> and so it's uh, the first couple of years are I, I was in the U.S. Army and served in Vietnam, and first-year teaching is tougher. Oh, wow. And, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, because there was not someone there telling me what to do, you know what I mean? Just let the door close. <laughs> You're on your own. It's, uh, so I don't want to... I don't want to make too big a deal over that, but uh, that's a great line. By the way, you should. <laughs> there tell could be that could, it could be unproven so far retention of teachers as well as retention of knowledge. Yep. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your interest. No, thanks, David. Definitely. So, would you like to like me to send you occasional updates or something? Of course, please. Yes. Uh, okay. I mean. We believe like we invest in many ed tech companies because there's so much improvements that must be made. Yes. Uh, so we would love to hear from you. Yes. Uh, I'll, uh, if, if, if you don't mind my hogging the conversation a little more, no, um, we, we're developing our software now, but we used someone else's software for two years. Uh, and it was an incomplete fit. It did about 60% of what we needed to do. Um, and, and that's where the 280 came from. And we feel that we can, uh, we, uh, I'm sure we'll do better with the fully customized uh, uh, tool. Um, and it's gonna be kind of a long haul to get various features in. I mean, we can do weekly mm -hmm. email, weekly SMS notice to parents, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. Um, uh, parents can log in and take the same quiz. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can. Yep. One of the features we have is it's really based on a daily quiz and, yep. and uh, uh, th data flows out of that quiz experience. But once we've collected that data, which gives us a measure of where the students are, Students welcome to take that quiz again. They can take, and the teacher can reward them for, well, you know, look, uh, you, why is your, your score so low? Over here, Sally took that quiz five times and, mm. and she, she didn't do too well three times, but now she's good. <laughs> so uh, the idea is that in, in looking back over time to leave the door open for all of that learning. Uh, mm. And a parent can say, hey, you know, uh, this was a, you, you were less than half on this quiz. Why don't you take it again? So it's, it's just uh, uh, this, this approach is now called assessment for learning, distinguished from assessment of learning, which is the traditional. Got and it. there's trem trem tremendous power in this. And I've seen the, the teachers just uh, uh, praise students for, I was in one classroom with, uh, with uh, uh, Megan and uh, she was going over the, the, the software, showed her which question on the quiz the students had missed most often, class aggregate. And so she put that one up on the big screen and said, hmm, this is, this is kind of a tricky, looks simple, but it's kind of tricky. And she said, did any of you make a juicy mistake on this? And the hands shot up. And it's sort of like, kids were proud of the fact that they knew what they had screwed up on. And that's a real, once you get the kids indoctrinated into real learning comes from error, as we all know. 
That's what I guess. Same with founders, like when you make a yeah. mistake, you learn the most. It's a ride, ride a bicycle, anything, yeah. So I have a question since, uh, of course, the yeah, right before COVID was always in person and now you're doing them remotely and over Zoom and how does that work? And, and because the, it doesn't, there aren't the same synergies or are there between companies who are sitting there in the same space, Murad? I'm just curious what you've noticed that's different and... Yeah, but absolutely, I mean, that's what we are all experiencing. Like right yeah. now, we cannot get together. So we are on Zoom, there's no other option. So I think people take it that way. Like if we were able to meet in person at Kettle Space right now, but if you were doing a Zoom call, I think it would be very like, like not engaging and bland, really not good. But since right now, investors, customers and partners and employees cannot meet each other in person, everybody just, you know, uses what's available. Uh, for the past like three and a half, co three and a half cohorts we ran virtually. And these cohorts actually, we look at the numbers and they are raising money. They are, their revenue is increasing. They are actually getting lots of traction. And from the last cohort, which ended actually three weeks ago, half the company has raised money already from demo day. So it's working, but obviously like I think being in person is so much better, obviously. Yeah. And we would love to go back to being in person as soon as it's feasible. So when you do go back to being in person, will you have any remote uh, teams in the cohort or is it going to be just... That's a great bunny question. Yes, very piercing question. Yes, definitely. Yes, we are not going to stop having remote companies because we see it as an opportunity. We invest in a company from India last year. They are doing agricultural tech hardware product sensors. Uh, we missed in a company from, that was in Dubai. So uh, depending on the situation, obviously we'll keep having remote companies, but I think eventually we want to go back to like fully in person, uh, maybe in 2023, I don't know when, but it'll be a requirement to move to New York City and be in New York City for four months eventually, but not for the winter class. <laughs> you know, by the way, you were the you were the last investor who spoke at our in person. It was it was March sixth. That's right, right before. Yep, you were the exactly. last at, at Bar Bar. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, monopolize. Anybody else have a question? If you always have a question, I hope. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, and I'm sorry if I missed you answering it because I we had Amish problems today. Power went out, in other words. Uh, would you mind oh, talking a little bit how you like to hear from your 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 the founders because. The one thing we find uh, in, in our room with Bonnie all the time is the founders are really reluctant to have messaging back and forth with the investors they're talking to. And I think it's so critical. Would you share a little bit about how to, what, what you'd like to see from your invest, uh, the people you invest in, in the form of communications throughout that process as they continue to grow and evolve? Because obviously you have long-term relationships with people. So if you want my Absolutely. sharing. Absolutely. So the companies that we invest in, uh, they go through the format program and then they uh, start building a communication list of people they want to keep updated. Initially, they email them every two weeks and then out of the program every month. And around like a year after the program, every two months with updates, progress, what's going on and very, very small asks. And then uh, they send us updates and we get on the calls with them all the time. They call us directly anytime. Some companies, if they're fundraising mode, uh, we talk to them daily. Some of them, you know, they're doing product development and growing, they just raise money. Like we touch base with them every three months. But we are very involved after the program as well. Like I usually have two or three or four ERA uh, alumni company meetings every day. So we make introductions for them when they're raising money or we make introductions as customers. So we are very much in touch with them all the time, actually. Thank you. Because that, that, a lot of people, like I said, are reluctant and it sounds like the other idea you have here, is, and you've said this throughout, is a system. It's a cadence. People get into it. They know what they're doing. You have those expectations. Those have been clearly defined. Those are all make a huge difference in how a, a startup 
functions early on because they get into that that mindset of it's important to communicate with key stakeholders correct absolutely absolutely so you really need to keep top of minds with the people that are relevant to you investors potential customers potential partners uh, it's always a good idea but in those emails initially you should not ask things like major things like you know would you invest in my company you should not say that you should just give updates and as you make progress people will be impressed and say oh like you went from like tommy's dating app went from like 10 users to like 100,000 users and they will say to you oh i want to invest can we talk so the idea is like really show people the progress and show people that you're like a founder that's really you know they know what you know what you're doing and you're updating uh, the right people about your progress without asking them anything initially. And eventually, when you're fundraising, you can just say to them, "Hey, now we are at like you know this this is the progress, and we have a, a convertible note open. Would you like to talk to us?" Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one more follow-up question? Given the number of women entrepreneurs on the call. What do you see the trend there? Because obviously we're seeing tremendous interest in Bonnie's room, but what are you seeing from your perspective as far as applications? Are you seeing a lot of women entrepreneurs coming into the scene? And Absolutely. Actually, half of our uh, founders are female. Uh, around, I think almost 30% are like diverse backgrounds. So uh, we've been investing for the 11, past 11 years into the best founders we can find. Uh, we actually do female founders uh, specific events for recruiting. Uh, we do a female founders uh, like ERA information events. We used to do it in person, but now on Zoom. And we also do like LGBTQ founder events. We do a BIPOC founder events. Uh, this week we did a climate startups events, because we are very interested in investing in climate startups. And climate is a huge area, obviously. But uh, going back to female founders, uh, our team is also mostly female, the ERA team. And yes, we are, you know, we would love to invest in more female founders. Thank you. I have a follow-up question, if you have a second. Do we sure. have time to plan? Oh, I'll go ahead. Um, hey, yeah, so uh, I guess with regard to showing um, like a good customer acquisition strategy or uh, some type of uh, traction before funding or before entering an accelerator, um, I, I feel like sometimes I would rather do things uh, in an accelerator environment or, or with support, um, especially if you're sort of changing the model, like your model is unique for your industry. Um, but I'm like also aware that like I can go create partnerships which provide customers, which provide maybe beta users before then. Um, and I think uh, you partially answered my question in that just establishing a dialogue with people about when you do these things is pretty smart, but I just logically, it makes more sense to do certain things, create certain partnerships when you're already in an accelerator environment. Um, so uh, I guess my question again is a little vague, but um, you know, I, I wonder how how much to initiate uh, the different like customer acquisition strategies. Like, for instance, um, doing like a crowdfunding versus you know creating a, a private partnership where you have like uh, users right away. Thank you, Tommy. I I totally understand the question. It's a great question. So actually, when investors look at you, they will look at your background, your information experience, network. And the, the one major thing they look at is, can this founder execute? Can she get things done? So anything and everything you can do right now before you go into an accelerator or you raise money will help you. But obviously, they should, they should not be things that may damage the company, like uh, not risky things, maybe like crowdfunding, if you have the right angle. But any partnership, anything, like partner with Kettle Space and run like dating hours, I don't know. So anything that shows that you can execute would be helpful to like future investors. Yeah. So execution capability is something we look very deeply into. 
like can has this founder execute because some founders say you know i'll build my product when i raise money and we say what do you have they're like nothing i'm just sitting waiting to raise money and that's not a good sign as bunny knows right so maybe come up with some metrics uh for each specific strategy and try and create some movement uh that can be shown uh anything and everything but there has to be a strategy obviously not just like going around doing random things but uh, try to do things that you that shows everyone that like you can execute, you can operate as a CEO and you have a general understanding of the markets and you are able to you know, operate in that market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because Great. again, Tommy, you know, dating apps are so difficult because there are so many dating apps and there are very, very few winners. So VCs are very, very wary of investing in dating apps, as you know. Right. So you need yeah. to really so show strong traction. Customer, yeah, strong exactly. customer acquisition and potentially like uh, reinventing the model a little bit. But I know that I, I need some definitely some advisors to do that. Um, so, yeah, just and, doing and Joseph, strategic. Uh, yeah, Joseph just sent a message. He has someone you should meet. There's a member at Capital Space. So, definitely uh, see that message. You're on your phone. So, just pointing out. Awesome. Yes, thank you. I didn't see that. Um, yeah, but just focus on strategy, focus on um, execution within those strategic um, um, beginnings, I guess. Yeah, that, that's great advice. Thank you. Yeah, sounds great. So it doesn't sound like you're a big fan of crowdfunding, Marat. Depends on the situation. I mean, <laughs> we've seen so many companies, so many different experiences. It makes sense sometimes, but sometimes it may be damaging to the company if like you, you have no other option and you're like, let me just do crowdfunding. It has to be a good match. Like what you offer on the crowdfunding campaign. And also like there's some like guidelines like in the first two days, if you do not get to 30% of your target amount, the camp, all these campaigns fail. So it means like you need to spend a lot of money upfront in the first two days when you launch on advertising. So it depends on the company again, <clears throat> but it's not a good match for every company. So I know that you're looking at um, hot spaces, of course, and why wouldn't you? And uh, top of mind these days in tech is the metaverse. So I'm wondering if you're seeing a lot of companies who are focused on AR, VR and, and that space. Great question. Actually, we are. We are very lucky because we just invested in a VR company that's providing mental health uh, CBT in virtual reality. We also had a company last year doing VR for uh, elder people to uh, play some games and see their reactions to predict you know, any potential problems. Uh, and those people are just playing games. They don't feel like they are having a doctor visit. So whenever, and we have like, uh, we do MS in VR and AR, but I'm a big believer in utility. So my background is actually in virtual reality. So I really don't think it's going to be mainstream at all. Like people will play games in it, but we are not going to like put on a headset every day and just walk in metaverse. I agree. <laughs> I completely disagree yeah, on like the Zuckerberg push right now. <laughs> on the records, we are being recorded. <laughs> so 10 years from now, you can play this and say, oh, that guy was completely wrong. We are all in our headsets. Because if you look at Gen, Gen Z and they're spending, you know, they don't communicate you know, orally. They're, they're texting, they're gram, they're on the gram, they're doing all that. So you wouldn't think that that's a generation that would be more drawn to the metaverse and a potential huge audience for it? Sure, but like Neil Stevenson wrote in yep. like Snow Crash, and Snow I Crash. read that book, that's how I, why I got into virtual reality, like in the 80s. But I really don't, I actually, I hope not. I hope <laughs> we'll be like meeting each other and not, like we, I hope we don't, we don't live in metaverse like all the time. Like we can play games, we can work out. Now people are using a lot of workout apps in virtual reality. Like I don't see us living in it all the time. I think that's ridiculous. Yeah. 
Thank you. So we have a, a few more minutes. Does anybody else have a question? I didn't mean to monopolize. Anybody else have a question or something to add? I know that uh, Will can never. Hello, this is so great, Bonnie. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you for being our, like, our guest once again. No, but I hope to see everybody in person soon, hopefully. <laughs> and ERA has a deadline coming up. I want to remind yes. if anybody's thinking thank about it. Thank you very much. November 9th, in two weeks, uh, we would love to have applications from your network, uh, from anyone that might be interested. Uh, yeah, so thanks so much for everybody's time. Great to see everybody. And thank you, Bonnie, for again connecting people. And thank you. And next time I'm in New York, New York don't worry, we will get together. Definitely, definitely. Come visit us. Thank you, Mira. Thanks thank so you. much, everybody. Great, great, great day. Thanks, Bonnie. See thank you all so much. You. And thanks thank for the you. background, Joseph. Thank you. <laughs> <A> pleasure. <laughs> right. Hope to see you all soon in person. Okay. Yeah. Good.